Hello, and welcome to episode 165 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today, we have a roundup of what we're reading. Enjoy. I'm Ann Dark. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together, we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkenstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. My first book will be The Last Exit by Michael Kaufman. It was sent to us by one of our many book fairies. This one happens to be Jackie Karna of Crooked Lane Books, and we thank her very much. This was published January 12th, 2021. Set in Washington, D.C. 20 years from now, climate change has hit hard. Fires were burning, unemployment is high, controversial longevity treatments are only available to the very rich. Enter resourceful young police detective Jen B. Liu and her partner Chandler, a sim implanted into her brain and her instant link to the internet and police records, and a constant voice inside her head. He's an inquisitive, tough guy with a hell of a sense of humor and his own idea about solving crimes. As a detective in the elder abuse unit, Jen is supposed to be investigating kids pushing their aging parents to exit so they are eligible longevity drug. But what really has her attention are the persistent rumors about Eden, a black market version of the longevity drug, and a bizarre outbreak of people aging almost overnight then suddenly dying. Is this all connected? Is Big Pharma at work? When Jen's investigation of Eden takes her too close to the truth, she is suspended. Chandler is deactivated and her boyfriend is freaked out by the thing living inside her brain. This leaves Jen to pursue a very dangerous investigation all by herself. This book gave me a lot to think about. With future climate change, it really makes you think twice about recycling those plastic bottles. (laughs) And also robots taking over people's jobs and high unemployment and also elder abuse and elder care. I'm listening. (laughs) I'm not dying to you can hang on. I'm sorry. Well, in this version of our future, and it may not be that much of a stretch, the Earth and its inhabitants are not faring very well. Climate change has caused soaring temperatures and fires that make breathing in cities unbearable. Sounds like today. Robots have taken the jobs away from workers, causing a devastating unemployment problem. Then there is ROSE, R-O-S-E, rapid onset fungiform encephalitis that is killing people who reach middle age. Pharmaceutical companies are developing a vaccine. It has an interesting side effect. People who are inoculated can live to be hundreds of years. And with advances in plastic surgery, these people can look fantastic. But unfortunately, like kind of today, only the very wealthy can afford this drug. There is an alternate black market vaccine called Eden. It'll extend your life once you have the onset rose and you're inoculated. You can live a couple of decades more, so more of a normal life expectancy. But this comes at a high cost as well, but it's not monetary. If you agree to the vaccine, your parents have to agree to be euthanized. Go get it. (laughs) So parents, if they choose to sacrifice themselves, shall we say, and you also have to agree not to have any children. Sign me up. I won't have any. (laughs) Well, 
Excuse me, you already did. <laughs> well, I meant going forward. No, it doesn't work that Can't way. Can't go back. So people are trying to convince their parents to, it's called the exit. And if they don't agree, they sometimes take matters into their own hands by killing them. Enter our protagonist, Jennifer Liu. She's an Asian police officer who works for the Washington, D.C. Elder Abuse Unit to protect the aging population. She has an AI implanted in her head Chandler. At first, I was like, oh, this is a sci-fi book. I'm not into sci-fi. But really, he was her partner. He was like a police officer partner. In and, her head. Yes. After a while, you kind of forget that that's where he is. And what was cool about it is I actually listened to this book. So they had two people portraying. They had somebody portraying Chandler and somebody portraying Jennifer. It really gave an interesting dynamic to the story. The way I would describe him, it's like having an Alexa or a Google in your head. And wouldn't that be kind of cool that you could just Hmm, wonder what that is. And you'd have the information. Well, they're saying that the COVID vaccine, they're putting chips in her. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Actually, it's funny you should say that because this story made me think a lot about what we're going through right now. And this book had a lot of similarities, like people are walking around in masks because they can't breathe the air. There's a vaccine being developed. So I don't know when Michael Kaufman wrote this book. I know it takes a while to get books published, so I don't think the pandemic was what brought this on, but man, perfect timing on his case. Jennifer and Chandler are investigating the use of this black market drug and the possible side effect that young people are aging overnight or within a week, becoming like 100 years old and dying. So there was a lot for Jennifer and Chandler to investigate in this book. And Jennifer is a great protagonist. She takes matters into her own hands. She gets suspended from the police force, which actually gave her more time to pursue things on her own. Poor Chandler got turned off for a while, so we didn't get his humorous look at the world. If you like a good detective story with a futuristic vibe, this is a book for you. I really enjoyed it, and I hope that Michael is going to develop this into a series, because I would definitely read another one. It sounds like a good read. I'll have to check that one out. Michael Kaufman is the author of two novels and seven works of nonfiction. He has worked with the United Nations and governments, NGOs, educators, and companies in 50 countries to promote women's rights. His website is michaelkaufman.com. My first book is by a friend of the show. We reviewed book one in this series called Wrong Girl in episode 101. Oh, I love that book. In February of 2002. This book is called Valentino Will Die. It's number two in the Bianca Dangerous Hollywood Mystery. It's by Donna Casey on February 2nd. We were sent this book by our lovely friends at Poison Pen Press. Bianca LaBelle is the star of this story, and back in the 20s, she was a silent film star. The Wrong Girl, we meet her as she leaves home. Oh, her story was She fun. runs away from home. <laughs> and goes, recreates herself. And makes herself Bianca LaBelle, or Bianca Dangerous is her film name. Well, in this book, she is finally making a movie with her friend, Rudolph Valentino. They've been friends ever since she's been in Hollywood, but they've never made a film before. In 1926, they are meeting at her house to discuss the movie Valentino tells her that he is going to die. He received a note saying that he will die. And, of course, she's going to keep him from doing this. Well, as part of the publicity for the movie, Valentino goes to New York City. Very shortly thereafter, he falls deathly ill. Well, Bianca gets on a train. There were planes back then, but they were kind of like puddle jumpers. They went from one little town. No, thank you. No, thank you. (laughs) Right. So she took a train 
which took her, I believe, five days to get to New York. Rudy was in the hospital, and he is dying. She promises him that she will find out who is responsible. Was it one of his lovers? Was it a fan? Was it a mobster who was jealous of Rudy and his success with the ladies? Or was it one of his associates? Well, very shortly, he dies. Bianca's there with him. They have his funeral. She goes back to New York, and she is bound and determined. She is going to discover who killed Rudy. Of course, the press put it out. He had a perforated appendix peritonitis. He was being poisoned. Donna's Casey has the knack of taking characters from real life and blending them in with her fictional characters. She has such characters as Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Mary Pickford. She has a section at the back of the book, When You're Finished, called It Really Happened? And then she has a section called It Might Have Happened. And you really need to read those because she goes into the history of Hollywood, the characters that are in the book that really did things that were listed. And then there are things that she just made up. But one of the characters in the book, you'll remember from the first book, was Oliver. Oh, yeah. Remember Oliver, the reporter? He got involved. I liked him. He is technically working for the female crime boss because she wants to move into gang territory that Bianca is involved with in her investigation. I loved the ending of this book. It just wrapped everything up so beautifully. And I can't say what it was, and I can't give a hint. This was a fun book. It took you back to the silent film, the action, the movie stars, the glamour, the yeah, party. That's a great time in history. It really was. I mean, if you dig right down to the dirt of it, it wasn't from the outside looking in. Especially the way women were treated. Oh, yes. But Bianca doesn't get treated like that. She is a kick-ass woman. Yeah, she's a little sweet And fire. she is a lot of fun. And I hope there's more of this story. I really do. Especially the ending I thought was so well done. Donna Casey is the author of the five Alifair Tucker mysteries. Alifair Tucker was a woman, Bianca was one of her daughters before she ran away. Donna has twice won the Arizona Book Award for her series and has been a finalist for the Willa Award and the Oklahoma Book Award. Her first novel, The Old Buzzard Had It Coming, was named an Oklahoma Centennial book. She lives in Oklahoma. Alifair does. While researching her own genealogy, she discovered so many tales of settlers, soldiers, cowboys, Indians, murder, dastardly deeds, and general mayhem that she said to herself, Donna's You have enough material for 10 books. The resulting historical mystery series set in Oklahoma in the booming 1910s features the sleuthing mother of 10 children. Donis is a former teacher, academic librarian, and entrepreneur. She was born and raised in Texas, lives in Oklahoma, and now lives in Tempe, Arizona with her husband, poet Donald Couser. Her website is donniscasey.com. And you will not be sorry if you read this book. I remember when we interviewed her, she told us about the second installment, and I remember being very excited about it. This is moving right to the top of my to-be-read list. Yes, and you will not be sorry. It gives you all the glamour of Hollywood, and then it gives you some of the dirt underneath of it. For That's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these stars that were up on pedestals kind of get a little clay feet. It was a lot of fun to read. My second book is called Two Truths and a Lie, and that's a popular game that I think gets played at parties. Especially if you're drinking. (laughs) Somebody has to spot the lie. And it's by Ellen McGarrahan, an investigator and her search for justice. It was put out February 2nd this year. 
by Random House. This is a true crime. In 1990, Ellen McGarahan was a young reporter for the Miami Herald when she covered the execution of Jesse Tafaro, a man convicted of murdering two police officers. When it later emerged that Tafaro may have been innocent, McGarahan was appalled by her unquestioning acceptance of the state's version of events. The revelation propelled her into a new career as a private investigator. Decades later, McGarahan finally decides to find out the truth of what really happened in Florida. Her investigation plunges her back into the Miami of the 1960s and 70s, a dangerous world of nightclubs, speedboats, and cartels, all awash in violence. She combs through stacks of court files and interviews everyone involved in the case. But even as McGarahan circles closer to the truth, the story of guilt and innocence 